What is up, everybody? Welcome back to Tidal Gardens. So today I have a longtime friend, but I have not seen him in a good long while. Actually, no, that's not true. I saw you um, a few weeks ago, but I haven't seen your tank in a really long time. So if you guys haven't seen this channel in a while, this is uh, my friend Nathan. He lives about 40 minutes down the road from me, and we see each other once every few years, it seems. <laughs> oh, yeah. As I've recently been coaching kid baseball and soccer teams, that kind of has phased out now for me. He's beyond my level, or he's not playing baseball anymore. So there's only so much I can do. And uh, so You say that, but I think it's really more about the dogs. Like you're a dog tuber now. That would be generous. <laughs> yeah, I take <laughs> videos of my dogs. Yeah, enormous, enormous dogs. And one of the videos went like mega viral. Um, oh, with the dogs. Yeah. yeah. And I just remember like you changed the, the the name of your channel from like Nathan's Reef Tanks to like Nathan's Reefs and Malamutes or something. Malamutes and Reef Tanks. My name's out of it now. So anyway, uh, we were at your tank and it's looking really good. So let's just kind of go over just a general introduction of what size is it, you know, is it mixed reef and whatnot? So I guess like, let's start with that. How big is it? So the display tank is about 450 gallons internal dimensions, I believe. It is nine feet long by three feet front to back and 26 inches tall. And if you figure in the thickness of the glass. I think it's about 450 gallons. Most people don't figure in the, the I know, thickness but I feel glass. like at some point, like- Cause it's a, it, it, it's a lot. It's like, I, I think it's a 550 gallons if you don't count the glass, if you do the outer dimensions. So yeah. I felt that was a bit much to say I have a 550 gallon tank when it's actually only holds 450. So <laughs> yeah, at, at some point though, it's- It's a nine foot long tank. Big That's, is big. Yeah. When I was um, designing some of my uh, aquariums and I kind of specced out for a uh, quarter inch thick glass and that soaks up so much of your dimensions because when you when you send your um, your specs to like a custom manufacturer and you want like a three quarter inch base, three quarter inch euro brace uh, up top, that's an inch and a half. Of height. Ideally, I wanted my tanks to be closer to like 15 to 17 inches tall, but that shaves off like an inch and a half already. And then like the water line itself shaves off another like inch and a half. So of the actual water in the tank was like closer to 12 inches when, once I was done. Like big mistake just because of the thickness of the glass. So when you quote the, the volume of your tanks, are you uh, quoting internal or external dimensions, Than? Oh, I just throw in the external. <laughs> because, because again, after a while, it just doesn't really matter. Because yeah. if, the, if the tanks are like ten and a half feet long by like three feet, it's they're big enough. They're big enough to be a maintenance nightmare. So. Um, the the only time that the the volume ever really matters if if you're dosing something that's like volume specific. Correct. And so when you ask what the total volume of my system is, I'm not 100 percent sure because I haven't done those calculations. But there's a uh, I think the sump is six feet long underneath my tank, and then there's a five foot frag tank. So we're starting to get to 650 gallons, I, I think is what, if I'm doing a measurement of dosing something, I go with 650. Yeah. So. And there's only so, so much accuracy you can really get in there. Cause after a while, like if you, especially if your systems get complex enough, the amount of plumbing and size of plumbing start to, to start to play a big part. Never, I haven't factored that in. Yeah. There's a lot of water in the plumbing. Because there's like a, in this facility, there's miles of plumbing. And I was joking that like there's there's some coral farms out there, like smaller niche coral farms. And, you know, they do like a very good job. But it's just a completely different scale because I say like there's more water in my plumbing than they have in their whole farm. Yeah. Well, it's you can talk. How, how big are those drains? And returns Between, downstairs? Yeah, so the drains are either three to four inches. Yeah, and you don't really get a sense of that. I, you hear that, but if you haven't really seen one, how big that pipe is, yeah. you, 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 know, you see it in person and you're like, well, there's a lot of water in there. And the longest drain line that we have going from one of our tanks to the sump is like over 60 feet at four inches. So yeah, you do the math on that. There's a lot of water that's mm -hmm. going to be in there. Yeah. So and are those... One of those was like heated up and bent and curved a little bit, right? For yeah, several of those. Some of the routes. Yeah. So. Yeah. 
It's crazy. Serious stuff. Anyways. So back to your tank, though. <laughs> okay, so it's it's uh, roughly in that 450 range, right? Correct. Okay. I, I just like, what do, yeah. what do we agree what on? What have we been talking about? <laughs> and it's a mixed reef, mostly Acropora dominated, it looks like. Yeah, as, as it grows in, it's, yeah, it, it, there's some torches. Torches seem to handle the flow for me the best in there. Uh, when it comes there, I had, I've tried some, I do have some octo spawn and frog spawn, but, um, when that, when I put a colony like that into a lower flow air tank, it, it triples in size. So yeah. it holds, you know, it's a little bit tight because of how much flow it is, but it doesn't seem to slow the growth down. That is kind of the, one of the downsides to having like, uh, an SPS dominated mixed reef because, because the, of the amount of flow that you need you kind of make these sacrifices on the on the appearance of other corals. That's correct. Because yeah. a lot of these other corals, they can do really well in super low flow tanks. I've literally had chunks of frog spawn colony break off and I brought it here. And then I think I, it might have been we went out to grab something to eat and we came back and the staff had fragged it up and it was already expanding and i could not believe how much space it took in one of your frag tanks versus you know how it was in my tank it was i it looked like four times the size in ten, yeah once it spread out so yeah i'm also noticing that in some of our tanks here this is one of the things where like the, the staff had like constantly turned down uh like the the flow from the closed loops all the way down to like one out of ten and sure enough all those corals in there are enormous and looking super, super fat and healthy looking. So yeah, certain things definitely don't love being neighbors with, with acros. I always considered like, I'm going to build a mixed reef, but ever since my first tank, which was a 93 gallon cube, then I had a 200, six foot, 200 gallon tank. And now this one, I always feel like I have moderate flow, but I don't, I have, I have a lot of flow. I've always had a lot of flow and I always just feel like it's not like I wouldn't consider it high flow, but it really it at the end of the day I think it's high flow, but I'm like yeah, it's not that much flow, but then I see I see other applications or places like here. I'm like that coral, I didn't know it does it does that. You know, well, it doesn't have much flow and it looks really nice when it doesn't yeah. have much flow. I guess we can just talk about the, your your system like topic by topic. So since we're on the topic of flow, what do you have all going on? Obviously, a return. Yeah. So the return on the main display is an Abyss 200. When I originally set up the tank, we designed it to have two closed loops with Vector L2s running. Mm -hmm. And I was going to see if that would be enough with that and the return to, you know, satisfy the amount of flow in the tank. I believe shortly after setting it up, I was like, I don't think it's enough flow. And so I added two MP40s to the back wall f facing out towards the front the flow would come and, and, and hit and well up. And I started to like, I, that's pretty good flow in my opinion. But then I started to feel that the, like that, that wasn't enough flow. Maybe about a year in, I added an MP60 to the right side of the tank in the back, back corner. You can hardly see it from the front. And then that's part of why I did it. And I've been doing that for about two years. Okay. Then just recently, that MP60 creates a current around the tank and let's say it's counterclockwise, but it's always counterclockwise. Sometimes it's stronger than other times, but it's always counterclockwise. I was like, well, I want to actually totally reverse the flow or the current in the tank at times. Uh, about a month ago, I added a MP60 to the left side of the tank in the back, in the back corner of the left side, I should say. It is now anti-synced with the other MP60 and it literally causes the water to then change in direction to be clockwise and uh the torches you can see it back and forth and it's it's every two or three minutes at at, at the most uh where the currents change but and do you ever actually have them all going at the same time to like create like a really i have flow? i do have uh i have them well those, those are always anti-sync so like they might be on like the reef crest okay. mode together but i think they're still playing off each other but there's times where they might both be near 50 percent and it's causing turbulence throughout gotcha. the tank that with the mp40s being on that type of mode and the vector l2 closed loops it it's does a lot start of yeah randomization yeah. and um i do have on the mobius just a little program where i do click it and for four minutes they're all pumping max okay and that that kicks things up pretty good but what's occurred since i added that sec second mp60 is 
Throughout the day, the fish are picking at things and debris starts to get loose. The wrasses I have in there will nip at stuff in the sand and then they filter out the really fine silty sand and they just kind of kick it out their gills. Well, that doesn't settle down at all now until it goes down the drains into mm -hmm. the filter socks. Like throughout the day, it progressively gets a little siltier and siltier because they're kicking that stuff up. Then overnight they go to sleep in the morning. It's, it's much clearer. The first week of having that MP60 running, there was a lot of debris getting kicked up by the fish and stuff. A lot of that has now been filtered out by the socks, but um, did you always have a substrate in that tank? Yes. From day one? Yes. And okay. I always want sand in there. Now, with the flow and everything, there's areas that are bare bottom because the, the sand's been pushed into different directions and into piles, which I don't really mind. And I have ideas of some encrusting corals and stuff that I'm going to put in those areas and see how they do. Right. In fact, that's already occurring in some areas. You don't often see um, a tank with like super high flow and a substrate. It's usually one of those things that kind of gets gets sacrificed. Ultimately, I want my tank to be a look like a mixed reef and I want wrasse fishes that like sand. So yeah, I've, it's just always been, yeah, I know some of the difficulties of having sand in high flow, but. Uh, I like the look of sand. Oh yeah, absolutely. Sand for me is always kind of tricky because in one sense, it could be like a very low maintenance time bomb where it just kind of like accumulates detritus over time and then causes like problems later. Yeah. But I've also seen it on the other end of the spectrum where people have used sand to be like very proactive maintenance instead of keeping like a crazy clean bottom that you have to like scrape with coral for coralline and stuff. Because if you have like a, if a bare bottom tank and you want to keep it very laboratory clean, it's actually difficult because the first thing that likes to grow on a completely fresh yeah. substrate or not substrate, completely empty glass floor is hair algae and stuff. You would never have this problem in a, in a mature tank, but because you've provided like a blank slate, all your problematic algaes and stuff are going to grow. Yeah. So your tank is always gross looking unless you're scraping it all, all the time. time. Yes. Yeah, I agree. And so the folks that are trying to get that pristine laboratory look, they put sand in there. And they aggressively clean the sand, and it always looks cleaner longer than if it was bare bottom. So it's like these two ends of the spectrum. Yeah, because yeah, you're going to eventually, the bottom's going to turn purple with yeah. the coralline. And, and, and a lot of people don't like that look. Which is like the back of my aquarium is black, and I do let the coralline grow at times. And it mutes the the colors of the coral when you're, you're looking at it from a display standpoint. And so... Uh, I scraped the back for your your video. It's a good like black yeah. black palette back there. Yeah. It's nice. I messed up in one of my tanks. I had requested an ABS overflow box, and I should have requested something that's a lot more stealth and black. Because what I have now is I've got nice areas where it's black black where it's the glass, but that overflow box. That's ABS. ABS is in white or gray? It's it's black ABS, but now it's purple ABS because of Coraline. It's, you can't scrape it very well? It doesn't do mm -hmm. much. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's so I, there's like a, this, this big section of just a Coraline pillar. Yeah. And it's like that, that's kind of lame. Yeah. I shouldn't have done that. I happen to like being able to scrape clean black a, well, a background. We've learned you like the sterile environment for... Yeah, at least the look in terms of for propagation anyways, right? Right. Cause Which there, I understand. There, there's a lot of benefits to having like an ultra clean tank in that way. And it's not necessarily great to run an aquarium that way, but the benefits in like organization, the benefits in just being able to label stuff and then keeping the labels clean so you can read them. Like all this stuff kind of plays into what I like to call borderline unsustainably clean. But yeah, you run into like stuff that that most people don't run into. Like you're going to run into hair algae. Like why is there hair algae? It's because of you. <laughs> yeah, you've, you've, you've provided it an environment to grow on. Exactly. Everybody else at, the, at that point in a tank's age would never have these problems. Yeah. But yeah, it's still worth it, I think. As far as like flow goes, like talking about closed loops, I kind of did the same thing in several of my tanks where I was really hoping that the closed loops themselves are good enough. A few of the tanks, absolutely. 
Others, I've, I've had to add at least like one pump because it's, you know, my, my tanks are like so long. But your tank is every bit as long. It's like nine feet, right? Yeah. I think that the closed loops are very valuable Yeah, because it provides a lot of flow internal that's amongst the, the rocks thing. and internal of the corals, you know, as those colonies are growing up. I ran in it, into the problem in my 200 was that the colonies would grow so big that they'd start to suffocate themselves. And a lot of times detritus or something gets on them or something occurs in deep inside the colony and infection flares up and then the whole colony yeah, goes I, or you're chopping up a colony to save it. In bigger tanks, I practically think that they're a necessity because you can try to put like a power head inside the rock. But then at some point you're gonna have to maintain that power head and getting a power head out of the rock is going to be really challenging. Yeah. And the nice thing about having a closed loop is you can kind of like build it all in, but the maintenance portion sitting outside of your tank that you can just like shut off some valves, take the pump out, clean it, do whatever you need, put it back in, and all that plumbing just kind of like stays put, mm -hmm. which is like super nice. I know that your tank is not a peninsula, but in a peninsula tank especially, oh, yeah. closed loops are super, super nice because without a closed loop, you're kind of relying on a pump to send it the entire length, which so, yeah. they exist. So my frag tank's peninsula, actually. Okay. And that's just a closed loop, just one closed loop in there and the returns. And yeah, it, it's super helpful for that. Yeah. But if your show tank was a, was a peninsula, getting to the opposite end is really challenging right. because you can get like, you know, like an Abyss Flow Cannon, for example, or um, like a CJ Voyager 10, and th that will get you 10 feet. But right at that pump, there's nothing that can go on there because that is such a powerful pump. You're kind of losing that end of the tank. And then the force that it's sending it all the way across there's there's going to be like a highway of there's no implications. Yeah, there's a no fly zone there. <laughs> yeah. But when you have closed loops, you can be a lot more, I, I guess, like strategic about you know where these outputs are all going to be, and you can have it like pull water from that overflow side, eject it all on the other end, or vice versa. You can really get like the mix that you need. Yeah, I'm positive when I was talking about setting up this tank and thinking about the design of it, you and I talked and talked about closed loops. And I think it just so happened at the same time, um, Jake Adams at Reef Builders was building, I think it was a nine foot tank or 10 foot tank. And he was, he put closed loops on that too. And I was like, that started to give me the comfort level. Cause you, you know, you think about the worst case scenario with the closed loop is you have holes in the bottom of your tank and mm -hmm. well, we're, we're three and a half years in and worst case scenario hasn't happened. Yeah. So that is a concern that gets brought up a lot. And you know, obviously, I thought of it. I thought about it too, because a lot of these fittings, they do, they're vibrating, and they do kind of like unscrew a little bit all the time, and you have to go. I back will in be there checking my fittings as soon as I get home because it's been a little while. <laughs> it practically doesn't matter because any time that we've had the slightest leak with one of these closed loops, the idea that it's going to empty your tank is never going to happen. Your tank will evaporate all the water in it a hundred times faster than it'll drip out of a pinhole. Oh yeah, like a, yeah, yeah. It'll never happen. Yeah. But it is one of those things where like, yeah, I'd, I'd prefer to not. It, it's driven. That. Yeah, it'll seal itself up. Yeah. Yeah. Or a lot, something will so, so, catch in there. It, it'll, it'll take care of, care of itself. <laughs> and it kind of does to, to a large degree. But that to me as a worry, gonzo yeah. like I'll no tell my wife whatsoever. yeah it's dripping but it's it'll be all right it'll it's, seal it's, up it's dripping in the sump yeah. who cares yeah. you know that sort of thing the only thing that i would suggest if anybody out there wants to put in a closed loop is to spend the money on good bulkheads specifically my favorite is probably the hayward and the reason why i like the hayward so much is that it reverse threads so it doesn't it's not righty tighty anytime that you've got to like mess with uh, with anything in there it's essentially getting tighter. So if you had to like undo a bulkhead for something on the on the pump, uh, that that type of torsion is opposite. Ah. If you're threading something into the bulkhead, you're not also undoing the bulkhead. So you're at the other end of the pipe from that bulkhead, yeah, it's is, tightening. Yeah, that's kind of nice. Also, the Hayward design it's, it's very uh, it's very robust and it's it, it just feels a lot more security. I like it even more than the Spears. Not going back. I'm, I'm not going back and uh, changing mine. You can't. The other problem is that all bulkheads have different sizes entirely. Mm -hmm. There's not a standard size. A Hayward is gigantic in comparison to other inch and a half bulkheads. So you didn't need a larger hole. Yeah. 
Yeah, you ain't drilling another hole in a glass tank like that. No. So last thing about flow, how important do you think it is in the hierarchy of stuff? At one time, I would have put it further down on my list. And there's some folks out there that have it right at the top. So where, in your opinion, is the importance of flow? Uh, I think near the top if not the top. I say that half because I, I have high flow, but I'm always pushing for more flow. You know, I thought I had moderate flow, but actually if you compare it to just about anybody else's tank that I know of, it's like, well, actually it's pretty high flow. Yeah, like and, multiple MP40s, multiple MP60s, and yeah. a busy 200 return, plus closed loops is right. a lot of flow in any yeah. tank. Yeah, and um, I've run into the problems with lack of flow, and it's not for lack of devices pushing flow, it is for things choking themselves out mm -hmm. with the dense growth and then you start to see the, the problems especially with like acros colonies is where i would see it the most i had a uh, oregon tort and a uh, hawkins uh colonies that were just massive and they both started dying from the middle out and they just get to the point where there's no flow into that middle section and bad stuff happens there infections and uh just die off it's not just flow it, it, part of that make sure you have enough flow the other one is you got to do some trimming to to make sure that because uh, they grow denser with with more flow. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. So. so I wonder if the folks that have flow rated higher on their personal list, it's kind of informed from like a desire for SPS specifically. Because I think that there's certain corals like we had talked about before that really like low flow. And I think that a lot of times when people say like flow is important, I'm looking for more of it. You very rarely hear flow is important. I need to tone it way down so I'm not blowing the flesh off of my large polyp stonies. Right. Yes. Too much flow it can be a problem. Uh, no yeah. doubt. Especially with torches and things like that that are kind of like waving around. I mean, I've I've certainly put in just like moderate laminar flow against these things, and it's basic practically peeling off. Just just because it's that constant flow from one side. Yeah, yeah, which is part of the reason I like now the second MP60 was uh, to, to total direction it. change. And it it's not like it's thrashing stuff all around, but it's a total direction change that starts to lift stuff out of the colonies and the the rocks, the detritus that settled in through one flow pattern. It it really does make a difference, totally reversing that, that yeah. current. Yeah. What would be the top of your list? If it's not flow, then what? Are we talking about like equipment wise or concept wise, yeah. Uh like uh, lighting or uh, water chemistry stability would be number one if we're talking Okay. Like alkalinity. And I guess I look at it because I keep a lot of SPS, but mm -hmm. um to me that's like consistency, stability in the water is number one. So what is your current methodology to maintain chemistry? Because there's probably a lot involved. Yeah, so I do about 15 gallons auto water change a day. And then I supplement calcium, alkalinity, and magnesium using a, you know bulk dry mix that I mix up in the buckets. And then, and then just dosing it in. Dosing pumps. And then my top off is 100% calc. It all comes from a calc. Mix it up once and let it settle. So I don't have a stir or anything. Mm -hmm. I do about 50 gallon batch at a time. And so what is your evaporation rate per day? Uh, so I'm using liter meters to do it. And I, I, I believe it's around 16 uh, liters a day. 16 liters a day. Okay. Yeah. So that's about four gallons, give yeah. or take. Yeah. So four or five gallons. You just know that. That's yeah. I, I, I do things a little bit different. I don't have like a s auto top off sensors. I have putting a specific amount to my liter mm -hmm. meter for the water changes and for the top off. So I'm keeping an eye on the water level when I'm doing that, but it's very consistent. So it's not necessarily something I'd recommend to somebody else, but that's how I do it. It also depends on the it. size of your system too. Like if, if you're talking about somebody's 30 gallon, you probably want to get pretty darn specific. Right. And in like my 2,500 gallons, I don't care. Yeah, It's not possible to overdose it, really. Yeah. In your system, it's big enough that you're close enough to your evaporation rate. Yes. And you haven't had to put in more. It, it covers it level. Uh, during the seasons, it might change. It changes a little bit. You know, if the furnace is running it or the air condition is running, it's it's drying out the air a bit and evaporation increases a little, but it's not more than a liter a day. And it's the way I have it marked, it's pretty noticeable within a day. Okay. So you're doing automatic water changes daily. You're doing three-part. 
and then you're doing calc on top of that. Correct. Do you do any um, like periodic large water changes? Rarely. I, I haven't really come across the need for that. Okay. What's what's rare? Like once a, every two months or so? Not even. Maybe twice a year I might do a 100-gallon oh, wow. water change. Um, Which is, would be like 10%. Be like, no. No. Well, 100 would be... Uh, 20%. Yeah. So there's other times where I'm vacuuming out detritus in the frag tank or doing something in the sump and I'm dra- draining water. Real quick, I have 25 gallons additional water change. Like with if there's a frag show or something like that, that I'm I'm setting up a tank, there's a lot of water mm-hmm. being brought out and having to be replaced. So that's yeah. happened. Part of the reason the tank probably looks so good is, uh, you know, I've been doing a lot of that over the past... There's a frag show recently, and then I had to spruce it up a little bit. The YouTube tank tour game has really been up to cross the spectrum. So I had to, I saw some of the old videos of my tanks where I hadn't scraped uh, the back, or it's just all grody in the frag tank. I was like, oh, I can't, not these days. There were a couple of times that I went to somebody's house, and uh, we literally had to spend the first hour cleaning t- their tank. Uh. <laughs> it's like, and, and I know it's like when you do that, it's going to kick up a lot of stuff. And it's better doing that than shooting it as it through, was. Yeah, through it's like, it. this tank is nasty. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so we need to clean some immediately. It's, it's, do you want to touch on the elk monitors that I've been doing? Sure. So it's been, when Alcatronic first came out, I, I ended up getting one pretty early. And uh, that worked really well for me for a couple of years. And it really helped identify any trends with elk. Now, I didn't necessarily always know if the testing was dead on accurate from a, like a parts per million or whatever, but I, it would definitely show me the trend. If, like, why is it dropping? Oh, because you forgot to refill your elk container and it just mm-hmm. ran dry. Well, that helped me catch it days before I might have noticed otherwise. And so... That had been running for quite a while. And then uh, I started having some nagging issues with that. I wanted to look a little bit into the Proflux controller and GHL stuff anyways. And I ended up implementing uh, the KH director. I've been running that for about a month and a half. Again, the test reads a little bit different than my Salifert, but that doesn't matter to me as much as just knowing the trend. Trends, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I like to keep my alkalinity between eight and a half and nine on the Salifer test kit. So now I see the trend one way or the other, and I've really dialed in the dosing. I also changed over my dosing pumps from, I had just the uh, the big black box with one dosing head from Bulk Resupply, and I had that hooked up to my Apex on a timer, and that's how I've been doing it for years. While well, I added uh, the GHL dosing pump for alkalinity, calcium, and magnesium, I've found some of the nice... Uh, Features of that allow you to plug in the volume of your container holding the solution, and it'll tell you when you're running out. And Mm -hmm. I'm sure that's been around for years, and I I just kind of discovered that. And I was like, well, that's really helpful so I don't run out. Uh, Anyways, I do value alkalinity stability amongst the highest of anything in in reef keeping, but I keep a lot of SPS, and that might be the most sensitive to elk readings. And then I did have the Mastertronic, and... With that testing, I think it was t- testing magnesium, phosphate, calcium, and nitrate. And those were all nice to know, on a, I mean, if you can, on a, on a regular basis. But like I said, my energy and time had kind of waned uh, for the reef tank and the chores. Uh, some functionality uh, mechanics on that unit went a little awry and I just found that I didn't miss knowing those results four times a week. Flying. You stuck with it a lot longer than we did because we've dabbled with like a lot, a, several of the auto testers. Mm-hmm. And I am sure that for hobbyists, they work great, especially if you're on the more tinkering side of things. But for us, the minute that we got an error code, we ignored that thing for six months. Yeah. And it just, it's one of those, you just simply did not work out for our workflow at all. Yeah. And I think that a lot of folks go into it not knowing how finicky that they can be and how often you have to recalibrate, how often you have to check for errors and stuff. Right. And when they're working, they're working really nicely. And they give fantastic information. It's fun to see your elk consumption 
eight times a day or 12 times a day just to see the varying levels mm -hmm. um, and know, oh, wow, you can tell when the lights are at their peak cycle intensity because you can actually see the alkalinity is being consumed faster. Yeah. But with our neglect level here, uh, when it came to like keeping up on that stuff, it got to a point where the numbers didn't mean anything to us because we couldn't rely on Trust anything. Trust right? Yeah. And yeah. at that point, it doesn't have a ton of value for us. Right. I, I don't know. I think that I might, I might dabble back into it if there was like commercial grade stuff rather than hobbyist grade stuff. There's some uh, testing equipment that like public aquariums use. And it's not like automated, automated in the sense that it does it's not gonna do like five tests a day or whatever, but it is basically like a push button test where like you hit it once, it's gonna do the test, that sort of thing. Yeah. And the nice thing about something like that is anybody can do it. So you're not relying on like, oh, the one guy that does the test versus another guy that does the test, you know, you could have like some it's variance done in the there. same way, right? Right. It's, yeah. it's, it's the one button. So, yeah. So I think alkalinity is something worth testing two to three times a week. For me, if something happens and it's not dosing alkalinity solution for me, it's, there's a pretty good drop. Mm, you can tell. And yeah. Within two days, it's like, we might be in trouble. We're getting to trouble territory. Mm -hmm. You could still correct it in time, I think, but it's substantial. So two to three times a week, I test, I think I have a testing two times a day now mm -hmm. for alkalinity. Then I test everything else with test kits once a week. And I know some people, you know, get away without testing that often. Uh, or other people say, you know, well, I let the corals tell me when they're unhappy. Mm -hmm. And when I hear that, I'm like, if your coral's visually uh, giving cues that it's not happy, you might be on the razor's edge. Of, yeah. You know, first of all, it takes time to recover from being unhappy, right? Coloration changes or behavior changes. It's too late at that I point. don't agree with allowing a cor an animal, you know, to be stressed to tell you that it's in trouble. <laughs> like, yeah. That's what's happening. And now, you know, I try and keep a good environment and, you know, I have my losses too on times, but yeah, the, I'll, I just wait until I see something off with the coral. Then I know. I was like, well, that's kind of late, right? <laughs> there were tools available to catch this sooner. Yeah. 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 I, like I said, I ran low on energy and time for a little while, but I still found the time. It really takes you 15 minutes if to test the, the major parameters yeah. so and like tanks looking pretty good so it made yeah. it out of yeah whatever lack yeah, it of was, attention it was, yeah like it was stuff like you know side glass might be dirty or for a very long time the front of my glass is never dirty or at least it's two days and it's scrubbed there's never coralline algae on the viewing panel maybe mm -hmm. up in the corners and stuff and like more that. importantly there wasn't like oh there's like a full tank crash and yeah. blah 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 and but I, w I was getting to the point coralline algae it was growing on the front surface a little bit. And that's, you know, for me, that was like, wow, I've really let things go. <laughs> yeah, it gets dusty, but this was coralline algae. And I was like, yeah, man. Like, I'm about 15 pounds heavier than <laughs> I thought I was sort of thing. <laughs> yeah. Do you do anything with Trace? Uh, I do. Red C has the A, B, C, and D, which have the various Trace elements. Okay. And they they base that off of... Like you can kind of calculate how much based off the consumption of calcium mm -hmm. by your system. That's been my rough blueprint on when I'm dosing my traces, which I generally mix up a new batch of salt water and it generally lasts close to a week. I dump the, my trace elements into the new, new salt water mix mm -hmm. and then they get supplemented into the tank over the course of the week. Um, so it's how much calcium per week am, is my system using. That is how I've implemented using those various trace elements. And um, when I've done an ICP test, most of them come back within range. There's been a couple that are a little low. How often do you do that? The ICP, ICP. tests, I've started doing them now like every month and a half, but I've, I've done it about- Fairly frequently. Though. I've done it about three times now because I, my potassium was a little low and is it fluoride, fluorid? Uh, Could be a, fluorine or fluoride. I'm not really yeah. Sure. Um, one of those was relatively low. Mm -hmm. I started to bring those up slowly. And so I'm doing like a month and a half as I'm bringing those up and seeing the results of that. It wasn't like they weren't redlined or anything. I struggle with chasing down a lot of ICP numbers for the trace elements of specifically. Yeah. Um, my whole thing was just try to get it off of zero as best I could, not necessarily trying to hit any specific number. Having said all that, we do trace here and I have noticed a lot of things do like it. Benefit. Yeah. yeah. 
some stuff that was kind of struggling and, and locked up started to, to grow again once we added trace. Yeah, I think I'm doing relatively significant water changes, you know, over the course of a month if you add it all up. Mm -hmm. So I think that helps. And then adding those traces help. Yeah, I have a feeling that the water changes is probably not keeping up with with trace consumption. No, I, I think it helps supplement it, but I don't think it keeps up. No, if you just look at the mass of corals per yeah. water volume, even though it's a lot of water, I'm starting to have a lot of coral volume. Yeah, and lots. so they're they're soaking up everything they like to soak up. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I definitely water changes alone would not help enough unless I was doing 50% a week or something. Right. But the supplementation helps. Are you adding anything else? Uh, any calcium reactor or anything? I didn't no see No calcium one. reactor. No. I've never okay. never used one. And I don't know. It's, it, for everything I've implemented on my tanks, from UV to ozone to calc to I, for whatever reason, I, I don't know if I'm intimidated by a, a calcium reactor. Oh, or not. I just... Probably, I, I mean, if you don't need it, you don't, you don't need yeah, it. Yeah, I, I answered the question on the calcium reactor before, too. I really just like being able to adjust the dosing pump by mm -hmm. millimeters or milliliters. It's like that feeds the control freak of like, I can be really precise with monkeying these numbers a little bit one way or the other, mm. even daily if, I, if I'm noticing a drop on things. So... Mm -hmm. Um, and there's something to be said again about simplicity. It's just like, you know what, it's just, that's just one other thing. Yeah. It's a little bit of a tangent, but over the past three years, two, uh, so the tank's three and a half years old. After having the tank up and running for about a year is when my son got into travel baseball and I started helping coach that. And it was a grind. It was fun. I enjoyed it, but it would suck the energy and time. And then I was also coaching just like travel level soccer. Uh, I don't know a ton about soccer, but at that age, they just needed somebody to wrangle the kids. So I was doing that. And that drained my energy for doing reefing at the same level I was doing before by quite a bit. Now, I still maintained the tank. Like that was always like, the tank's going to be healthy and the fish and coral are going to be fine. But I wasn't always uh, as involved. And like I said, there's I used to be on the forums and I'd be posting and sharing stuff about my tanks and stuff like that. And that just, that was done. And I wasn't really tuning into much other than Tidal Gardens. Oh, but yeah. no, oh, it is it is true. But that's what we were talking. We haven't don't see each other quite as often over the past couple of years. And that was part of it too. So, But he's decided he does not want to play baseball anymore. And he is in uh, club soccer, so I don't coach. <laughs> you know, I'm drop off. My daughter's into dance. I don't. I don't dance. So mm -hmm. um, that frees up not just time, but energy again, and outside the uh, other daily activities and the dogs. So, but. do you think that the simplicity of your maintenance helped you kind of like weather that? Yeah. So, like people would ask, how many hours do you spend maintaining your tank a week? And I'd be like, well, it depends on the week, but I got through design and understanding, maintaining my previous setups, what I wanted to do for this setup. I could get by with an hour, an hour and a half a week at most, mm -hmm. where I refill the the salt water, the fresh water, the top off, make sure that the three parts good to go and clean the glass. And other than feeding, that's it. But over time, you know, pumps start to build, have build up on them, stuff like that. So just recently really kicked back into like all my pump heads are clean and all this, you know, maintenance that isn't necessary, but aesthetically it's good it looks to keep much nice. On. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think that goes to, um, that's like a, a good learning point for a lot of folks that are trying to design their system, or maybe this is their first system. Maybe it's like they've been doing this for a while, but then they want to redesign a completely new system with all the stuff that they learned in the past. And you kind of have to figure out what kind of reef aquarist you are, because there's certain types of people that just want to tinker. They love to tinker. They love to always be in their tank dabbling with stuff. I think that those types of systems, anything can work. But if you throw a wrench into that operation where all of a sudden you're a baseball coach and you're, you're taking your kids to soccer all the time and you have a dog YouTube channel now, any number of these other things that detract attention away from your tank, if you had put together that tank to require that level of doting and then all of a sudden that doting stops for some reason, it falls apart really fast. What I've kind of done here is that I try to make every job 
as simple and easy as possible. Because I think that when stuff does fall off a little bit, for whatever reason, people go on vacation or what, it stays on course more often than not. That's one thing to always consider when you, you're kind of like putting together like your entire methodology. Yeah. Part of my philosophy in setting up this tank was make everything easier and stuff that you hated on your old tanks doing, like scraping the back. The, the aquarium on my old tank was tough. It was six foot, more or less up against the wall. Mm -hmm. You know, there was plumbing behind it, but there was you, you could not get a body behind there. And now, you know, I have a nice little uh space between the tank and the wall and that was intentional because mm -hmm. to be able to get behind the tank first of all it's nine feet long so you're not getting to the middle back without that kind of access but um uh it makes scraping much easier you know i pop in some ear pods and listen to whatever and i've done something similar with my aquariums with what my big show tanks is that you basically have like a scaffold behind the right. tank and that's super helpful because being just at ground level not good enough you need to be up a little bit higher and to dedicate the space, which is every bit of what, 15 to 18 inches. So you can actually fit a platform behind there. Mm -hmm. It's super nice, isn't it? Oh yeah. And in setting up my tank, I whenever I come over here, I always take a look at not just the corals and the fish and stuff, that's fun, but I'm always looking at how you've run things and set things up. And that was a huge portion of, you know, setting up my tank was what does he do here and why? And yeah, again make it easy. The one step that I've taken that I don't know if I saw at your place was labeling. Like this comes in super handy because because obviously you're the one dabbling in your tank. You know what everything is. I Because I have a staff, it makes more sense. But every now and again, you go on vacation and you have other people come over. Mm -hmm. And at that point, these are complicated systems once you get to a certain size. They're all have some base level of complication to them. And at that point, it's like, okay, some random person, you know, reef buddy is going to come into that mess. And even if, even if it's like an organized mess, it's your mess, right? Yeah. But having everything labeled, idiot proof labeling is so helpful. I had the, the plugs going into the power bars or whatever. I had those labeled at one time, but now all the MP controls on the back, like they're not labeled. I know mm -hmm. what they are, like yeah. you said, but if somebody walks in, then <laughs> that's a really good point considering I'm going on vacation this summer. There and, you uh, go. Yeah, because you know, have everything communicate to perfect strangers. When I went to Hawaii a couple of years ago for two weeks, I had a Discord channel with a bunch of several other people who are stopping in the house and that's where like this is here this is here this is here this is here and this is how it's done and this is what these pumps are doing and it was the least i've worried about one of my systems uh since i started setting them up 10 12 years ago one other thing that i really liked doing is um you know how like when you have like a cable modem part of sometimes troubleshooting a cable modem is like oh restart the cable modem right and there's no on off switch on the cable modem if like unplug it and plug it back in right <laughs> yeah so you start unplugging random stuff and it's always in some like weird place tucked behind a cabin or something inconvenient so i put in like one of those american dj switches like for my cable modem right just was like oh i need to restart the cable mm -hmm. switch wait 18 seconds, <laughs> turn it back on, right? But I did something similar for the aquarium stuff because there's certain things that are oftentimes tied together. We have like a feed pump that goes to like a UV sterilizer. Well, you really should turn off both of those things together, right? Or in the case of like ozone, if you're maintaining your protein skimmer, you really want to turn off your ozone generator. Right. Right. That sort of <laughs> stuff. So I just have that on, on like a panel and they're kind of like organized together. If you wanted to turn off anything involving the skimmer to clean up the cup, the switch for ozone is right next to that. You just like flip them all off together. Again, going back to the whole thing of, of just having like uh, like a house sitter to come in and take care of your tank. It's so much easier if all the things are just evenly like laid out there. Yeah. Tech tips, guys. Tech tips. <laughs> Organizational skills. Yeah. I guess like moving on, we can talk a little bit about lighting. It's I don't think your lighting has changed a lot since the first time you set it up. No, so the, the I set up the Orpic Atlantic 4s over top. There's five over the display tank, two over the frag tank. And I do, I really like them. I thought they, they've done very well for um, the coloration, the coral health and everything. I, I was missing a little blue pop. Like I just knew it and I could not get it from the channels. And I was setting up a frag tank at a swap 
And I was using my old AI Soul Blues, you know, mm -hmm. we're going back 12, 14 years, which is what I used to have over some of my older tanks. And I had tanks that, or uh, corals coming out of my tank that I'm putting in my frag tank at the swap. And this, the Royal Blue lights from the AI Soul Blues are just bringing out some color that like, I was like, oh my gosh, those are, you know, it really brings a pop and a shade of color out of this vibrancy out of some of these corals. Um, how, how can I get that back? And somebody at the swap was like, well, the, uh, Orpic OR3, I believe they're called mm -hmm. the strips, the bars. Mm -hmm. bars, uh, blue plus. He said, that'll do it for you. I was like, all right. So I ordered three of those. And so I have two, four foot strips, bars over top the display tank and one over the frag tank that did it brought the pop out to some of the, the colors that you just get washed out maybe by the white. Not that I'm looking for super blue, but it does uh, bring that out, especially in the evening when I, I go more blue anyways. Um, the other thing I like about bars in general is that it gives you um, a little bit more of like a spread out light. It's a little bit less in the case of, of your Orphix because they're kind of like big panel lights anyway. Right, which was something I was looking for too. Yeah, because a lot of folks, they have like the Radeon type lighting, which is kind of more of like an individual puck thing. Even like the newer ones are a little bit more panel-y. Yeah. But they're still in a, in a more concentrated area. Yeah. It's a, the it's spread a comes from thing. there, but it's still yeah more directional. Whereas like the bars give you a little bit more like a, of a T5 type coverage. Not as good <laughs> still because I mean, like T5s, you know, they had the reflectors and everything like that. So you get like crazy angles, mm -hmm. but it's better. The other thing I did like is the, to be able to like angle them yes. just because of the way that they, they, they mount. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I mounted mine uh, near the front of the tank. So then they, they angle towards the corals that like 45 are 45 degrees or yeah, ish, yeah, give or take. Right. And so that helps fill in and, and, and bring out some. That was like my biggest concern with a lot of LED type fixtures is that they might have the spread to cover certain square footage, but the directionality and the shading and the shadowing effects that happen, it's almost like you really need to like overdo LED just to get the, the same sort of like I would say coverage, but coverage might not be the right word. It's the the older style lights with the reflectors and everything like that. Well, the light almost like massages into like Wraps the nooks and the crannies. Yes. Yeah. 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 Whereas LED typically doesn't unless you just go overboard with like the number of fixtures. Yeah. And the geometry of the fixtures. So you're, you're, so you're happy with the bars. That helped a lot. Yeah. I'm toying with the idea of adding two to the backside of the lighting structure. I don't know if that'll really help much visually from uh, viewing from the front. Maybe, so. yeah, but it might it might prevent like a dead spot from yeah. like on, on the underside of some coral perhaps. Yeah. Speaking of the underside of some coral, I don't know if you got any shots or saw, but a lot of them are encrusting underneath on the rock structures. And oh, that's cool. It's pretty tense <laughs> if I'm trying to get some of those out of there. Yeah, we'll get that. We'll get to that. I think maybe, but yeah, that's. I mean, it's it's always good to um, to see that kind of like grow down onto the rock. But I again, I always worry about like that that shadowing effect because it's almost like the su the successful growth is the cause of its future demise. Mm, yeah, sometimes, right, yeah, in terms of like both flow and light, right? Mm -hmm. Whether the concentration of its thickness plus its ability to block out light to itself. And, yeah. and causing issues. You wouldn't be experiment with like another type of light. You're like super happy with it right now. Yeah. And, and part of it is, um, you know, how do I mix in a different, totally different light fixture? And there's no need for more light in my opinion. I, if I switch out lights, it, you know, it's, it would probably be the whole, the whole kit. And that's yeah, and a lot, and that's actually, a lot, that's a, that's a, a non insignificant expense. <laughs> no, not, Yeah. Light seas, they just simply aren't cheap, period. Yeah. Unless you just go straight up like, you know, Amazon black box type stuff, which by the way, does work to grow corals, you know, just throwing that out there for, for, the, for, the, for the folks on a budget, just about any light these days will grow corals just fine. <laughs> I think that people are, are uh, splitting hairs as to what they really want to get out of lighting to, to pay any kind of premium. It can be done. I guess the only other thing I was thinking about in terms of like lighting is that if you were just to add more light, aren't you like up against like the the limit on a fifteen amp circuit? 
I have a couple of them. I have three of them all in that area oh, okay. accessible. That's good. When I had, well, I think when I had the the home renovation done, I had them put a box with two separate, I think it's 20 That's amp nice. circuits. So there's two 20s and then maybe the old is 15. So I have it spread out amongst those. Yeah. yeah. That, I was thinking about that. You're like, this is where the tanks are and I want to get a big tank. It was before I got the big tank, but I was like, I'm getting a big tank down here and uh, we're going to need more electricity. Yeah. More Lighting juice. takes up a, a lot. And so when it's all plugged into like one one outlet, mm-hmm. it's like, right. yeah. Yes. <laughs> I've, I've blown many a breaker just because. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So we haven't talked about filtration yet, I don't think. Okay. I guess like starting from your overflow box, coming down in yeah, to your so, sump. Yeah. So everything is plumbed into the same sump. So the uh-huh. it's all one system, the frag tank and the display tank, and they all come down into the sump. And I have the big, are those seven inch filter socks? Is that what they refer, refer to? The, it's either a four or a seven. It's so. seven. It's the big ones. Okay. Um, so I have three of those that the water will go through. So I have the open, the, the, the more open mesh. I use one of those okay. in the... So they're from the front of the display to the back is kind of how the, they run. And mm-hmm. I use two of the fleece. Fleece. Two yeah. fleece ones and then the mesh one. Because the mesh one's generally easier to get out and it's yeah. just a little bit further and to pull them. I, and that way I have three different ones. They, they they capture things a little bit differently. But I think I'm going to switch to the, the mesh ones. You know what? You might find that. They don't catch enough? Uh, they. I almost think they almost clog just as fast. If oh. not faster, and it's weird. I don't do they know. Clean easier though. Yeah, we, they probably we, we do. They probably clean easier. Yes, okay. but I I was thinking that too, and then I was like, well, the mesh def or the fil- fleece, and my findings seem to capture a lot more, and they seem to be allow more flow longer. Oh, I, I know it was counterintuitive to me too, but that's what I've noticed. I wonder if it's like a bacterial film that like, it could be. That, yeah, that clogs. Yeah, because you look at the the mesh and it doesn't look like it should be clogged but it is interesting so hmm. and uh shout out to my daughter who her chore to get a cell phone is to change my filter socks oh, and hilarious. rinse them <laughs> there so you go. good job lexi i might have to tell her like seven times over the course of two days but she eventually does it so. yeah just gonna cost you a million dollars by the time she's 19 yeah, but whatever yeah <laughs> so anyways <laughs> goes through the filter socks that lexi changes and uh it goes in her fugium area uh, where I have Chato growing and it grows into mass quantities. There's sometimes other funky algae or slime, which I think I got something going on in there at the, on the, the bottom right now, but, um, that's all in the refugium mm-hmm. overflows into the skimmer chamber. So mm-hmm. within the skimmer chamber, I'm running skimmer, which I believe is an Aquamax cone six, mm-hmm. uh, which is, well, might be six, seven years old now. Also in there, I have a double reaction chamber for carbon. Okay, carbon um, only? Carbon only, yeah, okay. I don't run GFO. Um, I don't necessarily keep on top of changing that carbon to make sure it's always fresh. If I think there's a contaminant or something in the tank, I, I'll change it for sure. Otherwise, it, it, it probably isn't there longer than it's effective for. Mm-hmm. And then through that chamber, we get into the return pumps. I did just recently implement ozone but we're talking like three days ago. So I don't have a whole lot of input other than that device can pump out a lot of ozone really quick. I turned it on for the first time. It was hooked up to my skimmer and I just kind of cranked it up. See, all right, let's see what we get. And within 30 seconds, I was smelling ozone and <laughs> like a lot of it. And I was like, wow, that's really pumping it out. And that obviously turned it way down. My yeah. implementation of ozone now, which was my plan, uh, is... I'm doing 45 minutes at like 1 a.m. and then turns off and then turns back on for 45 minutes at 3 a.m. And like I said, I've only done it for three days. So there's some folks out there that would um, that would cringe a lot <laughs> at, uh, at at your first go with those. Well, it, I wasn't huffing it or anything. <laughs> like I smelled it and I was like, yeah, that's we're done with that for right it's now. Like, oh, that's not good. It's like that black box definitely does something different. Yeah, yeah, that that is not snake oil. It's doing something. Yeah, it, yeah, exactly. I was like, well, it does work. Yeah, ozone is a is kind of tricky because you need to. You need to, to take it seriously. Yeah, right? you need to take it seriously for sure. Because so Raj from MRC. Like he's horrified that people are using ozone. 
in like non-public aquarium settings. He's right? watched this. He just cringed. He's just like, oh, who is this like, amateur? Like he cringes that I use ozone sometimes. Uh, and then he was just like, I smell residual ozone in your facility. And I'm like, yeah, me too. But I, I have like these safety detectors, you know? And it's like, OSHA says I can be good up to like here. <laughs> and we're only at one bar. And he's like, he's like, yeah, except for the fact that I'm literally smelling it like right now. <laughs> like there's something wrong right now. You need to like, do something about this, like vent it out or what. Uh, which is, by the way, something to going back to our discussion earlier about like venting out that that helps with the ozone mm -hmm. possibilities, right? But um, my residual ozone thing completely went away when I upgraded to like a much larger skimmer that had the correct reaction time. My skimmer was simply too small for my system and it wasn't, uh, like the contact time wasn't nearly enough. So the ozone was just kind of like flushing right through and then getting into the air. It, it still might've been safe, but it was still getting into the air. Now we have these skimmers that have ports that we can vent outside, but so far we haven't needed to because there's like zero ozone smell now. And, and again, our little safety meter has always said it was safe, but there's like no trace of it. And that's been really encouraging, but it is something that you're going to have to like dabble with. Well, yeah. And th that's why I'm running it short amounts of time at night. And mm -hmm. so anything that escapes down there is more or less going to be in that area and it's it'll dissipate within 40, 45 minutes totally. I know that you're also running UV. Yes. Where's the UV intake pump? It is more or less in the same chamber. As the skimmer. Yes. And, and the UV okay. will break it down, correct? Very fast. Yes. So like uh, an O3 molecule is highly, highly volatile. That's why it works. It oxidizes, right? Well, that bond, that extra oxygen bond in there, that likes to come apart and UV is really good at breaking that bond. Yeah. If you're having it recirculate in there, there's a good chance that a lot of the residual ozone, at least that's in the water, is going to be broken down by that UV because mm -hmm. it's an 80 watt UV, right? Yeah, it's that big one from yeah. bulk resupply. You know, here's the other thing about, about ozone since, uh, since you brought that up. There's a lot of material that are like ozone resistant. Yeah. That does not mean. It completely ignores ozone. It starts to it, it has, starts to get yeah. a little. It gummy. resists it for a little while longer. Yeah, it turns out like resist <laughs> is not inert. <laughs> so like we use like silicon tubing and stuff like that, and it's fine for a while. Well, your lungs will resist it for a while. <laughs> yeah. And we're not joking about ozone. It, no, it can mess you up. It can mess you up. So Raj, one thing that he always cites is that you know it can actually cause sterility in young boys that have exposure to ozone. I joke, talk about not joking about ozone. I joke that that's, you know, that's a feature not a bug. But <laughs> the study that that's based on, I think it's you know cuz like obviously they're not just like dosing young boys with ozone. That's not the study. It was environmental ozone as a result of like industrial pollution. Oh. So that's kind of like there could be more o things involved. Other things involved. Yeah. yeah. Ozone was part of it, but But ozone's not great. So right. You know, it is something that, especially in, in your home, should probably take it seriously. Yes. In my business here, I did take it seriously. Those skimmers were not cheap. The fact that they are possibly going to be vented out, not cheap either. Just that little detectors, I think it's like 400 bucks. I'm being flippant, but I'm not actually being flippant about it. Just uh, You take it seriously, but you joke about the subject matter. Yeah, because I don't care if I'm yeah. sterile. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Going back one stage to your refugium. Yes. What do you think of it? Is it something that you really like or would you just like do I've, away with it at some point or? Like all the extra stuff on the bottom. I have those uh, biomedia cubes, you know, that, mm -hmm. you know, can house. Uh, I don't know how effective that is. The ceramic uh, stuff. Yeah. But the, um, the Chato definitely absorbs quite a bit of nutrients, nitrates and phosphates. And it's noticeable if I heart, you know, it it can get packed in there and it can, it can be like a five gallon bucket worth that I pull out and still have a lot left. Mm -hmm. And uh, that does make a difference. Like when I harvest that, you can see the nitrates start to come up a bit because mm. I've taken away an absorption source and 
then as it starts to grow and get to a certain mass, then it's sucking it up even quicker. Yeah, I've heard like varying opinions when it comes to um, to refugiums. Like, I don't think there's any question that they process nutrients well. The criticisms I've always heard is that it usually causes like the just the accumulation of like detritus and stuff like that if it's not cleaned regularly. And it also is like a safe harbor for just nuisance critters, like random flatworms and stuff that somehow are like dealt with in the whole, in the main display, but if left unchecked are just like yeah. flourishing. And, and, and there's and, not the wrasse that eats them exactly. in the refugium, right? Yeah. I'm on the fence, but there, there's definitely some folks that have very, very strong opinions when it comes to refugiums. That's kind of- Yeah. Do I think I could I run that. without it? Probably. It would be interesting to see what nitrates do, like the nutrients, phosphates and nitrates, because I do feed quite heavy. It I, definitely accumulates detritus down there. And uh, I was vacuuming out recently after a long time of not and it wasn't even it was silt it was just piles of silt in some of the areas it really settled in i was just it was like oddly satisfying vacuuming vacuuming out silt <laughs> like oh wow, wow so is there anything in the future that you're like planning on dabbling with I don't know what can what more do I have to dabble with. One thing that I was looking to dabble with, if I get real sick of cleaning filter socks, I might like mess with a filter sock filter roller. Yeah, potentially that's something. Even like livestock, is there anything like some, some critter that you're trying to track down or? For quite a while, I had my eye on a couple of rasses that uh-huh. I was like, yeah, I'm gonna get those, and I think maybe down the road it will occur, but I'm not uh, hot on the path of those anymore. Um, Rare fish is like. A bad place to throw money. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Buying a high priced coral, probably better than buying a high priced fish. Because right? you know AI exists. Like you can just like just straight <laughs> up map map yes. over your 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 goldfish with like some nice like <laughs> yeah. rare anthias. Yeah. Uh so those that, that a couple of those were kinda on my list. Um, but one of the corals that had really caught my eye was the the, the insane plate coral, which mm-hmm. I showed you. And I've been looking for that for a couple of years. I had a friend who had it, and unfortunately he lost it. But I just tracked one down, mm-hmm. and so now I have a frag of that. I've so. got a trade on the books that we haven't executed yet, so I, I, I'm hoping to get my own. That's been on my list ever since I saw it. Yeah, that's one of those that it's like, wow. Like, wow. Obviously, you've seen a lot of coral, but like you're like, is that real? Like, Wow. And by the way, the the one that's in your tank isn't even fully colored up yet. Like that's no, like it's, been fragged it's on the smaller side. It it can get no joke ten times more vibrant. Than yeah, that. electric yellow and pink. Or yeah, it's yeah. crazy. It's, like, nice. it's cyberpunk colors. Yeah. When I did see it for the first time in person, it was at Top Shelf Aquatics. It made every other coral in that particular tank look like it was in black and white. And that was the only thing in that tank in color. Yeah. That's what it looked like. When I first saw pictures of it, I was like, uh, that's to- uh, totally Photoshopped. Totally. Like, you know, they turned saturation up to uh, 500. Like, there's no way. And nope, it's real. Yeah. I saw it in person. I was like, all right, yeah. I'm in. Unfortunately, they're they're still crazy, crazy expensive. I mean, yeah. Uh, so first of all, it's like uh, the idea that, oh, well, you can get it for less wholesale. No, you can't. <laughs> like wholesale mm-hmm. sounds a lot like four figure retail. <laughs> it's it's so expensive right now. Uh, but I I'm I'm really looking forward to trying to get my own because mm-hmm. I also hear that they're they're slower growing. Like it's not something that just goes crazy. Yeah, not a, don't know yet. Not not a problem. That you not yet. Have to yeah, face. yeah. We'll find out. But it's just settling in. So. We've been um, doing so many like crazy like capital intensive projects here. It's been a while since I've kind of like turned my attention to like acquiring some choice pieces the list is very short right now but that is one of the corals that's towards the top of that list yeah. i found um just looking at corals smooth skin acros right now are kind of catching my attention and i got mm. i picked up a couple of those recently those have been catching my eyes you know, like so. the speciosa and stuff like that or uh that or like uh is it granny losa and locani's okay yeah to you know they you know, some people call the the ones that have the more sparsely populated polyps yeah. and and the smoother skin, uh, like deep water or whatever. But um, mm-hmm. those have caught my eye. I got a couple of those recently that I'm pretty nice happy about. Looking forward to seeing those grow out. But um, like overall, 
the goal for my display tank. Like we're starting to get some pretty big colonies and like one single colony that fish can swim around or in or through, like that's what I've always wanted. And that's what I tried to get to. And with the 200 and uh, with the more space, that's what I'm looking for now too. going way back to one of your first videos that we were just talking about, like Mike's tank, the size of his acro colonies and staghorns and stuff back, you know, 12 years ago, that was when I, th I had a 93 cube at the time. And it was like instantly it was, that was a 300 deep dimensions tank. And it was like, I got to get something like this. And mm -hmm. it was, so I eventually I got a 200 gallon, six foot tank. Um, but like just the size of those acro colonies. I would say that your tank now has probably has like bigger stuff than the stuff that was in his tank back then. Yeah. He had some pretty staghorn, big, thick branched. And, mm -hmm. But yeah, some of the other stuff, and I actually still have some of his corals from him, which. Yeah. Like know, the efflorescence and acropora. The, the Hawkins. Aflo. And yeah, unfortunately mm -hmm. it, he took his tank down, but that was one of the big inspirations back then. And so that's what I'm hoping for is growing in these big acro colonies. I think you're really there because I think you're at the point where a lot of your stuff is like right on top of each other, probably fighting a lot. Yeah, there's a there's a few colonies that I don't like where they're at for their color or what we're doing. What I'm trying to do there, like I have a tabling in the middle of the top of a rock and I'm like, well, that's going to take over. That's not what I want there. And mm -hmm. I don't think I realized it was tabling until... It grew in. And, and you so, have like a giant chalice that's just like. Oh, yeah. That Raja Rampage is about to go on a rampage, I think, <laughs> up through through a really nice, colorful area. Yeah. Um. So, yeah. So we're getting to the point in some of the sections of the tank that I'm either going to pull a couple colonies out or have to cut some stuff way back. And this is the problem that you have in in a successful tank is that stuff does grow. Right. And and this is like one thing like for, for people shopping for corals, it's like. I want to find fast growing stuff. It's like, careful what you wish for. Yeah. Because yeah. a lot of you guys don't have, I mean, like like Nathan's tank, hundreds of gallons. And, and a lot of folks are like 30 to 50 gallons. A fast growing coral can eat up all of that space. Yeah. Sometimes you just got to go in there with the cutters and start lopping Rune. chunks off. And like I said, I was starting to, I, there's some changes I want to make, but I was like, well, Dan's coming in a couple of weeks. I don't want these big bare spots. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so in the next couple of weeks, I'm going to be chiseling some stuff nice. back. So, but yeah, that's, that's the overall goal for my display tank is active mixed reef. Gotcha. Predominantly a lot of SPS, obviously. And like I said, your, your tank is like doing super well right now. It was it was good to to catch up and and to see how it's progressed and how even with like waning attention at, at some points that it didn't end up in like, oh, I'm out of the hobby entirely. Yeah, that's that's tough. Like I don't know that would happen to like a total tank disaster. I'd probably take uh some time to gather myself, but I don't know if I being out entirely yeah that's really hard to think yeah i don't know if i didn't get out i'm not i'm not getting out you know <laughs> yeah at this point no i enjoy it and i've been plugging back into the the reefing scene and seeing what's going on and uh lots of cool stuff on youtube and in the forums and stuff that i stuff i didn't even ever ever imagine going on so mm -hmm. it's just fun to see what people have there's a lot of like really really cool revolutionary stuff happening with like you know with coral breeding and everything like that just like a lot, of, a lot of cool projects going on. A lot of great sharing of information out there in different formats too. And it's, it's strange to say, you know, it's just, it's just been a two years since I was really checking in on that multiple times a week and then once a week and then not much at all. And then getting back into it and it's like, oh, wow, you know. There is something new. The world didn't stop. <laughs> uh, my, I stopped paying as much attention, but. Yeah. Like, and and the fans been re replaced by AI. It's, like, yeah. it's crazy. Uh, yeah. It's, it was nice <laughs> yeah. talking with you, bot and all, but. Um, well, thanks again for coming. Guys in chat, if you have any questions, I'm sure that like Nathan would check in occasionally and perhaps answer some stuff in like more granular detail that we didn't cover in, in the podcast. I can do that. Again, thank you guys for watching. And uh, we'll see you guys next time. Bye. Bye.